In the previous video, I gave the set theoretic construction of the natural numbers. And what I'm going to do in this video is introduce piano systems and also transitive sets. And these are going to be very important for setting up uh, arithmetic on the natural numbers. So if you haven't seen the video already, I encourage you to check it out for a, a, full, a fuller discussion. So just by way of a quick reminder, what we did when we, we constructed natural numbers is we said that 0 is equal to the empty set. We constructed 1 as the set containing 0. 2 is a set containing 0, 1, and 3 con containing the set 0, 1, 2, and you can see how this is going to proceed for higher numbers. In addition, we set up the notion of successor. We said that if you have some number A, or actually more generally some set A, the successor A plus is going to be given by A union, the set containing A. So for example, 2 plus, which we would commonly call 3, is going to be given by 2 union, the set containing 2. So you can see this is going to be 0, 1, 2. And we also showed that um, the set omega, the set containing the natural numbers, exists from the axiom of, of infinity, which showed that there was at least one inductive set, and that we constructed the, the set omega from that. And we also showed that omega is inductive. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we introduced the principle of, of mathematical induction. We said that if you have some subset, let's call it A, of omega, and if you can show that A is inductive, then that implies that A is identical to omega. So in our discussion of the natural numbers, there are three major properties that I'd like to point out. First is that zero starts a sequence. That is that no number precedes zero. And we showed that in the previous video by saying that zero is not the successor of any number. Secondly, we had that for any number in omega, its successor is also in omega. And it's a new element in omega. And what I mean by that is that when you take the, the successor of a number, let's, let's say five, you get a, a new element, namely six. What you don't get is something like the successor of 5 being 2. So every time you take the successor of one of those higher numbers, like 10, you get a new set. You don't go back to a lower set, like 2 or something like that. Thirdly, we saw that the principle of mathematical induction holds an omega. So the three, another three important properties I'd like to point out is, firstly, that we had some set of objects that we're considering. In this case, it was omega. So that's the first. The second is that we had some starting element, some zero element. And thirdly, we had some notion of a successor function. And those three abstract properties are what we're going to really discuss when we're talking about piano systems. So the piano system idea is going to be just taking these three postulates, or these three axioms, and uh, also incorporating those three properties, the notion of a set of interest, a starting element, and a successor function. And usually you're going to see this written as an ordered triple, where you have this ordered triple being n, s, and e, where n is that set of interest, s is the successor function, and e is the starting element, what I, I call the starting element, or the zero element. So having introduced the intuition behind a piano system, uh, let's now introduce the definition. So the definition of a piano system is going to be the ordered triple n, s, e, where n is a set, s is a successor function, which maps uh, the stuff in n to the stuff in n, and e is that zero element within n. And we're going to say that this is a piano system if the following three properties hold. First, that e is not in the range of s. And well, what does this mean? That there's no number in the set n that you could possibly plug in as an input to the set s, to the, sorry, to the function s, which would output e. So basically that's abstracting the notion that zero is not the successor of any number. Secondly, that S is injective, meaning that there's no way that you could take the successor of, let's say, uh, 5 and get 2, because uh, the, sex the successor of 1 is 2. So that would violate the injective rule for this function. And thirdly, and this is going to be similar to the mathematical induction, that if A is a subset of N and A is closed un under S, then A is equal to all of N. And what does it mean to be closed under S? Here, closed means that if E is an A, and for all of the little a's in big A, S of A is an A. So you should notice that this is very similar to what we said induction on omega meant, that if the empty set is an omega, and if for all elements in omega, the successor is also in omega. So instead of successor A+, plus, what we said is that the S operation upon A is an A. 
So those are the three conditions that we need for this order triple to be a piano system. So uh, visually, what do these systems look like? So ideally, what we want to construct would be a, a system that looks like this. We start with E, we operate on E with S to get the new element, the successor of E. We operate again to get the second, success, the second successor of E, or th the successor of S of E, and so on. We keep applying the successor function to get the next element. So ideally, we want this, this nice line here. And the reason we impose these postulates is to avoid systems that look like this or like this, where we start to get these loops. And the reason why this sort of loop is ruled out uh, from being a piano system is that E is indeed in the range of S. Here's the input that you'd have to put into S in order to get E. So E is a successor of something. It's, it's the, su the successor of this. So this is not a piano system. Furthermore, something like that, like th that looks like this would not be a piano system because you can see that for this element here, S of E, it's serving as the output for two different inputs, which means that S is not injective. So the second postulate rules out things that look like this. And the third postulate, it's going to rule out systems that look like this. So let's say the system that I'm considering is this line here, and we just add in this other point B. It's just some floating point B, where B is going to be mapped through the successor function back to itself. So the set N is going to be these points, all of these points going out here, plus that point B. So the first two would not be enough to rule out something like this. So you need the third one because in this case, it's possible to take a subset of this entire thing, have it be closed under S, and have it not be equal to N. So that subset would just be, just take this line here, just take all the stuff here. And notice that it's, a, it's certainly a subset of n. It's all the stuff in n minus this point b. It's certainly closed under s, yet it's not equal to n. So this third uh, postulate is going to rule out piano systems that look like this, where you just have these floating points being mapped themselves. At least that's my interpretation of what this third postulate is doing. There might be another interpretation, but it's at least ruling out things that look like this. So that's the definition of a piano system. But it's not a vacuous definition in the sense that we're defining up something where, where it's never true. And in fact, we're going to show that we know of at least one piano system. It's going to be the order triple omega, the set of all natural numbers, sigma, which I'm going to define in just a second, and zero, that this order triple is a piano system. So the theorem is going to be this order triple, where sigma of x is going to be the successor function that we've already introduced, x plus, where it's just going to be, like we've seen before, x union the second containing s, x, and zero is just going to be the empty set, the, the zero that we're familiar with. So we're going to say that this order triple is a piano system. And uh, this is quite easy to prove. Uh, properties one and three. First, that zero is not the successor of anything. We've already shown that. And property three, that mathematical induction holds. Actually, the property three, the way you, we've just defined it, it essentially gets translated into the statement that mathematical induction holds on omega, which indeed it does hold. So properties one and three are pretty much already shown. And uh, property two, we're actually, this is going to lead us into the notion of transitive sets. Since uh, once we introduce the notion of a transitive set, we can easily show that this successor function, uh, sigma, is injective. So remember that um, what we're going to have to show that if sigma is injective is that sigma of a equals sigma of b implies that a is equal to b, just like you would show for any injective function. So this the, the requirement to prove this is going to lead us into transitive sets. And if you've been playing around with the definition of the natural numbers doll, you may have already observed that something like this is going to hold, something like this notion of transitivity. So we're going to define a transitive set as a set where the members of the members of a set are themselves members of this set. That is, A is a transitive set if and only if, if we have some x within A and we have some t within that x, that that t is also in the set A. And uh, this is better illuminated through an example. So we're going to show me that all natural numbers are transitive sets. So let's take an example. Let's say, uh, well, let's take the set 3. So the set 3 is just the set containing 0, 1, 2. And remember that 1 is the set containing 0. 
and 2 is the second setting, 0 and 1. So I can rewrite this set here as this set here. And furthermore, I can just rewrite this 1 as this. So 3 is just equal to this set. Now notice that in this set here, we have three members of this set. We have 0, the set containing 0, and the set containing both 0 and the set containing 0. So we have three members here. But let's look at the members of the members. Now for this first member, there are no members there, so we don't have to worry about that. Here we have 0 as a member of a member. And here we have 0 and the set containing 0. So the members of the members are 0 and the set containing 0. And notice that these two things are both here and here. So these two things are both in the set 3. So we can see that all of the members of the members are themselves members of the set. So we've shown that 3 is a transitive set. So here's the theorem that all natural numbers are transitive sets. And since we're making a claim about all natural numbers, it would be most useful to prove this theorem by induction. So here's the proof. We're going to let the set A be all those natural numbers here that are transitive. And here's just that condition for being transitive. So what we're going to do is that we're going to show that A is an inductive subset of omega. And that'll, that'll imply that A is equal to omega. So the first step in proof by induction is we're going to show that 0 is in this set A. So we can indeed see that 0 is on omega. So it satisfies that first condition. And it's also going to satisfy the second condition of being transitive because 0 has no members. So it's vacuously true that 0 is transitive. Therefore, 0 would be in the set A. So there's uh, the first part of the proof by induction complete. So suppose we have some uh, natural number k within the set A, and it's transitive. So we're going to show that the inference, if k is an A, that k plus is an A also holds. So we're going to show that, we're going to have to show that k plus is both a natural number and that k plus is transitive. Now the first part, that k plus is a natural number, that's, that's pretty obvious. But the more interesting part is to show that k plus is transitive if k is transitive. So to show that k plus is transitive, we're going to start with the premise that, or the if statement that if y is in k plus, and if t is in y, we want to show that t is in k plus. So we're going to start from this statement. And it follows that if y is in k plus, that y is in k union the set containing k, because this is just a definition of k plus. And I've just carried over that statement, and t is in y. So, so far in our deduction, we have this statement here, this proposition here. Now, let's analyze this proposition here, that y is in k union the set containing k. Now, just by the meaning of union, that implies that either y is in the set k, or that y is identical to k. And uh, that's the important step of this argument is to, to realize that that either y is in the set k, or y is in this set here, which in, in that case would be identical to k. Now in the, set, in the case that y is equal to k, I can just plop in k for that second statement there. So t would be in k. So I get this conclusion. That's in the second case, that t is in k. In the other case that y is in k, what I get is that y is in k, and t is in y. And since k is transitive, I make the same conclusion, that t is in k. So no matter what, whichever case it is, we conclude that t is in k. And furthermore, we know that k is a subset of k+. plus. So if t is in k, it must be in k plus as well. And that gets us to our conclusion. So we started with the, the if statement, y is in k plus, and t is in y. And we've concluded that t must be in k plus. So we've shown that k plus is transitive if k is transitive. And we've shown that a is an inductive subset of omega, and therefore a is equal to omega. So we've shown the statement that all natural numbers are transitive sets. So hopefully that was a fairly interesting property about the natural numbers. Uh, here's another useful fact about transitive sets, is that if a is transitive, 
that the union of a plus is equal to a. So uh, as an example, we know that all the natural numbers now are transitive. So now the union of 2 plus, which is equal to the union of 3, should be equal to 2. And uh, just to see why that is, 2 plus is just equal to 3, which is uh, 0, 1, 2. So the union of, of 0, 1, 2 should be equal to 0, 1. And just expanding out zero, the set 0, 1, 2, I get 0, the second containing 0, and the set containing 0 and 1. So now I'm just going to take the union of this. So I'm looking at the members of the members, just what union means. So here I have this member here, which has no members, so I don't have to worry about that. This here, which has one member, 0, so I write that down in this new set. And this member here, which has two members, 0 and 1. So I've already written down 0, and I have 1. So indeed, this set 0, 1 is equal to 0, 1. But now let's uh, prove the theorem that if A is a transitive set, then the union of A plus is equal to A. And this is a pretty simple proof. It's just a computation. So we start with the union of A plus, and we just use the definition of A plus. So this is equal to the union of A, union, the set containing A. And uh, in a previous video, I asked you to prove basically this thing, that you can essentially distribute the union operator like this. So I just distribute the union operator to both of those. So union of A, union with union of the set containing A. And now uh, one thing to realize here is that the union of the set containing A is equal to just A. Because I'm looking at this whole thing means the members of the members of this thing here. So this set here, the set containing A, has only one member, namely A. And the members of this whole thing are just precisely the set A. And to complete this proof, uh, I need one other fact as well. And I leave this as an exercise. What I need to show is that the union of A is a subset of A if A is a transitive set. And once that's true, the conclusion that this thing is equal to A just follows because A would be the larger set. So union of A is inside of A. So A is a larger set, so when I union the two, I get the larger set, A. And then the conclusion just follows from that. But one interesting, that, one interesting thing to point out from this theorem is that basically what this is doing, it's taking the predecessor of whatever thing I stick in there. So we saw on the previous slide that union of 3 was equal to 2. So basically what this operation is, is doing, it's reversing the successor operation. So that theorem that the union of A plus is equal to A if A, if A is transitive is, is what's going to allow us to complete our piano system proof. So now we can prove that that successor function sigma is injective by the following argument. Let's consider the possibility that sigma of A is equal to sigma of B. By the definition of sigma, uh, sigma of A is equal to A plus and sigma of B is equal to B plus. So A plus equals B plus. And we know that both A and B are in omega, and they're therefore transitive sets, because we've just shown that uh, all natural numbers are transitive sets. So we can use that theorem that we just proved. So if these two sets are equal, then the unions of the two should also be equal. So we're going to take the union of both sides. So we have the union of A plus equals union of B plus, and that gets us to the conclusion that A equals B. So we started that with the assumption that sigma of A is equal to sigma of B, and we've shown that it follows that A is equal to B. So it follows that sigma is injective. And therefore, the order triple, uh, omega, sigma, zero, is a piano system. That concludes this video. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe, and stay tuned for more videos on piano systems, uh, arithmetic on the natural numbers, and other topics in set theory. Thanks for watching.